We've been talking the last couple of lecture videos about Plains Indian culture and spirituality. And now I want to, uh, to broach a subject that you're probably familiar with, and that is the idea of a spirit animal or a spirit guide. Uh, this particular image, by the way, I did a Google image search for a spirit animal and Native American, and this is about the least... A cheesy and romanticized and westernized image I could find, which says a lot uh, about what uh, what I wanted to say on, on the subject. Now, first of all, to define terms, a spirit animal is uh, 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 an animal, a special spirit guide that appears to someone, usually um, through a vision quest or sometimes through other circumstances, uh, a representation of the spirit world that is there to uh, be your particular guide to help you learn things about yourself. Um, and depending on what animal that you happened to see in your vision, it could mean certain different things. And this too could vary from culture to culture and tribe to tribe. But, you know, for example, for a lot of planes tribes, uh, uh, buffalo in a dream or a vision might mean power. Um, eagles, eagles and hawks are uh, important because, and considered sacred, because they fly so high. They're closer to the heavens. Ravens or crows are considered special uh, spirit uh, beings uh, sometimes by many tribes and Actually, not just in the Western Hemisphere. A lot of the Germanic tribes in Europe uh, believe the same thing about ravens and crows because they're so often seen on a battlefield, so often seen near dead bodies. Uh, there has been this idea that they are special emissaries from the spirit world that appear when death is near or change. Uh, so that could, uh, that could be the meaning. But the problem is, you know, we talked early on about uh, appropriation. And if you spent any time on social media at all, particularly Facebook, but probably also other kinds of social media, you'll see these memes. Take this five-question quiz about your favorite colors, and we will tell you what your spirit animal is and what it means to the Native Americans. Uh, usually uh, without any hint that that could differ from tribe to tribe and person to person. And it's usually well, pretty ridiculous, to be honest. But even, uh, even so, uh, the very idea, well, it, it, it's even become a, a, an expression that I hear all the time. Someone will say, oh boy, I, I really admire Brittany Spears. She's my spirit animal. Um, that's appropriation, and that's inappropriate. As, as well. Some people will say that uh, uh, they get that from uh, Harry Potter uh, books, but I think that that was appropriated from Native culture as well. Anyway, if you are tempted to take one of those quizzes to see what your spirit animal is, I think we could just uh, cut to the chase and uh, uh, let this, let, you can use this image. Uh, anyway, so that's what a spirit guide is. It is a very serious thing taken very seriously by traditionalist uh, Native Americans. Uh, and it is not, you know, it's not something to take, uh, take lightly or to, to appropriate. All right, now I want to talk about uh, a uh, particular ceremony uh, that is common throughout the Great Plains, the Northern and Southern Plains tribes. It's called a Sundance. Now, um, today we've got the uh, Sundance Film Festival and the Sundance uh, uh, TV channel, all of which ultimately come from uh, the participation, I think, of, of Robert Redford, who played a historical figure called the Sundance Kid in an old Western. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about. This is a very, very special ceremony, uh, extremely sacred. Uh, it was, for reasons we will discuss later, it was illegal from roughly the 1890s all the way up to the 1970s, as a lot of uh, practice of uh, traditional native religion was illegal 
for Indians in the United States. Uh, it, they, are, they are still held. Uh, they began to be held again in the 1970s. Uh, they're still held by the various, uh, various tribes, and they are still very, very sacred. Uh, this is not the sort of thing tourists can uh, drop in on and take pictures. This is something that is only for the native community, usually only the community of that particular tribe. Uh, traditionally, this has been a way to uh, to seek to get closer to the spirit world and often uh, a way to seek particularly profound visions. And essentially how it works is the person who is uh, participating, and sometimes there are multiple people participating, uh, they take... Uh, uh, the people who are uh, performing the ceremony, not the ones who are undergoing it, will take these two uh, short, sharpened sticks. They're skewers. They're sharp on both ends. Um, you know, like four or five inches wide. Uh, sharpened on both ends. And stick each of them underneath the participant's pectoral muscle. Pierce the skin stick them under your chest muscle and stick them back out the other side. And then there are rawhide thongs tied to each end that are thrown up over this uh, sort of a scaffold. And uh, uh, sometimes you, you spend some time dancing, uh, pulling this uh, uh, buffalo skull around behind you by those thongs. And then they, they, they hoist you up and you dangle there uh, from your stretched chest muscles until you see uh, a vision, until you receive a vision, or until finally either the, uh, the thongs or your, your, your muscles snap and you fall. Uh, and um, this is uh, the sort of thing that, you know, if one, one might, uh, for example, make a promise to uh, the, the great spirit uh, that uh, you would undergo this ceremony uh, if certain things uh, certain things happened to you, or if you were, like I said, looking for a vision, the uh, the story is that Sitting Bull underwent the sun dance ceremony shortly before the Battle of the Little Bighorn and had a vision of uh, uh, thousands or, or not thousands, but countless countless uh, blue coats, American soldiers lying dead on a field, uh, which he took as a sign of upcoming victory. Uh, so this is, uh, on the one hand, it's it's kind of uh, kind of gross to think about on a, a physical level, but on the other hand, uh, it is something that is extremely, extremely sacred, and uh, just like the whole idea of uh, vision quests and and spirit animals, something that traditionalist native people take very, very seriously. Now, something else that uh, American Indians have always taken seriously is sports, the ball game, which is another one of those things that is almost universal throughout North and South America. Um, extraordinarily important. Of course, if you didn't know already, this is where the French got the game of lacrosse. Uh, you know, in the, uh, the, the northern plains, uh, observing the, uh, uh, the Indians there playing this, playing this game where they had the long stick with kind of the net on the end that you scoop the ball up with and you try to score goals. And this is also something that was taken very, very seriously. Sometimes uh, different, uh, different villages or different bands or even different tribes would compete uh, with one another, and it could get pretty rough. It could get really rough. In fact, uh, the Cherokee word for this ball game translates into English as the little brother of war. And it wasn't uncommon for people to be injured or, or even sometimes killed in these games. And uh, to give you an idea of just how important they were in the American Southeast with the Cherokees and Choctaws and so forth, um, among the Choctaws, if you had murdered somebody uh, in your tribe uh, from another clan, and therefore your life was forfeit because you had killed somebody, 
uh, if there was a ball game coming up, you got uh, uh, you got to defer that uh, execution so that you could attend or participate in the ball game because you know that's important stuff. Now, this is sort of like that idea of the wink day or uh, in more modern uh, parlance, two spirits, in that it was such a common and and deeply held part of of daily life, particularly for Plains Indians, and yet. You never see it in movies or on television. Again, not on old episodes of uh, Gunsmoke or Bonanza. Uh, in fact, uh, the only couple of occasions I can think of uh, with uh, Hollywood uh, movies and TV shows was there was a brief scene in Last of the Mohicans with Daniel Day-Lewis in the early 90s where you could see uh, some, some Indians playing this game in the background. And then there was an episode of the Western, uh, Hell on Wheels, which ran for several seasons on uh, AMC with Anson Mount. It was about the Transcontinental Railroad. And the two, uh, uh, the two heroes, played by Anson Mount uh, and uh, Common, the rapper who played uh, an ex-slave, uh, actually wound up uh, participating in, uh, I think it was a Cheyenne version of this game. And it showed just how rough that it was. But uh, it's one of those things that if all you know about Native culture is what you've watched on movies and TV, you would never even guess that something like this even existed. And yet, it was so extremely, uh, extremely important to Native culture. And there were, there were spiritual elements of it uh, as well, because in a way, while it is a game, it also was in itself, the playing of it, a kind of a ceremony and was something taken very seriously then, and still taken very seriously now. Um, there are still, well, in the southeast, it's called stickball. Uh, there are stickball tournaments. I attended one one time. Uh, certainly didn't participate, but I attended one in Cherokee, North Carolina. Uh, and uh, when it comes to uh, lacrosse, the Iroquois Nation actually fields um, a lacrosse team in, in global uh, international competition. And they're usually one of the top-ranked teams in the world, as it should be, because it's their game, right? Uh, also, something that is universal is the idea of there being sacred sites. Now, I talked about the, uh, the term wakantanka, which means uh, the great mystery. Wakan means... It can mean holy, it can mean sacred, it can mean mysterious. There are certain places, uh, certain sites, that are believed to have spiritual power in the Lakota terminology, believed to be Wakan. Um, there to the right is the Black Hills, uh, which are sacred to several different tribes. We'll be talking about that later on, several Northern Plains tribes. And there's a, a Bear Butte uh, there on the left. Uh, and every, every tribe has some site, usually multiple sites, uh, that do have that special mysterious power that are the places where ceremony have, has traditionally been held, sometimes specific ceremonies at specific sites, also extraordinarily important. Now, we talked earlier about the importance of balance, and we talked about it in the context of hunting, uh, for one thing, but uh, balance also becomes very important in other ways uh, where it comes to a human interaction. Now, in Almost every tribe in North America, there was the concept of blood revenge. There were not, at least traditionally, before the advent of Europeans, uh, there were not written laws. There were not uh, law enforcement agencies. But essentially, if you did something wrong, um, you would still, you know, uh, various ways have to pay for it. But particularly if you took a human life. If a human life is taken from one group, then someone, somehow, the group that perpetrated that act, or the individual and the group he represents, have to 
they have to balance that. They have to restore the scales of cosmic balance. And here's how that works. Let's look at it on an intertribal level. So let's say we're talking about, um, let's say we're talking in, in terms of Cheyenne and Pawnee. Let's say a Cheyenne raiding party uh, attacked some Pawnees and uh, killed, let's say, let's say they killed four of them. Well, the, uh, the Pawnees are going to expect that they are going to restore that balance. They've got to kill four Cheyennes. Uh, it might be the same ones who did it, but usually that doesn't matter. Just a representative of that group. Because there's the concept of communal responsibility, uh, more so than necessarily always individual responsibility. So the Pawnees might make a raid. They'll come and attack the Cheyennes and, you know, get, you know how young men are, get kind of carried away. Uh, and maybe they kill seven Cheyennes. So now the Cheyenne uh, uh, are owed three more. Right, so they're going to come back, and it's going to go back and forth and back and forth like that um, over time. Uh, and so, in that way, there's kind of a perpetual state of warfare with your traditional enemies, but it's a state of warfare in which uh, usually uh, not that many people get killed, uh, but it's a, a kind of um, it, well, it's like. I don't know, let's, let, let's say like, you know, uh, NFL rivals, like let's say the Bears and the Packers, they're going to play each other a couple of times this year. And whatever happens, you know, uh, they're going to do it again next year, right? Uh, and it's an opportunity for the young warriors to prove their mettle, uh, to uh, prove themselves. But let's say that it's not intertribal. Let's say it's within a tribe. And I kind of hinted at this. So let's say that um, you've got... Um, I don't know, any, any tribe that you can think of. Kiowa, let's say Kiowa. Um, a member of the same tribe kills someone in, uh, in the same tribe. Now, if they are from different clans, then the clan of the victim is obligated to then take a life. Uh, they will try to take the one who actually committed the murder, but if they're not available, then they will just take anybody that's from that group to balance the scales. What if it's within the same clan? Well, then it's someone from the family of the murdered person that will uh, take the life of either the person that did it or someone in their family so that balance is restored. Now, on the Plains, among the Plains tribes, there was... Uh, uh, another option that um, that didn't exist uh, in every every region of the country uh, called covering over. So that if let's say one guy kills another guy and the victim's family, they can accept a covering over gift. So the family of the murderer might pay a fine essentially and give uh, some uh, uh, co commensurate uh, gifts to sort of smooth things, smooth things over. So that's a possibility. But bear in mind that we're talking about tribes. Tribes are groups of related people, actually. A tribe is usually made up of several bands. Each band is made up of different clans, which is each made up of different families. But ultimately, they're all distantly related, right? They're from the same genetic stock, usually, except for those people who've been adopted in. So the kinship circle is extraordinarily important. So if someone is part of your kinship circle, if they are related to you by being a member of your tribe, then they're, they're in. They're either in or they're not. If they're not in, they're not in. Uh, this kind of goes back to the idea that early on we talked about autonyms or endonyms, a people's name for themselves. And among Indians, that name usually means something like the people or the real people or the main people or uh, sometimes can be translated as like the, the humans, the actual humans. Uh, so it's all important that people be in your kinship group for you to interact with them. And if they're not, they're not. So what that means is that 
with, uh, with the Plains tribes. Some of them are patrilineal. Some of them are matrilineal. We talked about that earlier. Let's say you're from a matrilineal tribe, um, and you've got um, a child is born to a woman from your tribe, and the father is from another tribe. Maybe the father's white. Maybe the father is uh, uh, some other from some other group. But if it's a matrilineal tribe, traditionally, that child is not considered half, um, half Cheyenne uh, or half uh, Arapaho or whatever. Either they're Cheyenne or they're not. And if it's a matrilineal tribe, if their mother is a member, they are a member, a full member. And if, uh, if it's a matrilineal tribe and their mother's not a member, that's something completely different. So when it comes to this balance thing and how that fits in with kinship, let's go back to that uh, theoretical raid we talked about. So let's say, again, we got Cheyenne and Pawnee. Let's say some Cheyenne warriors attack a group of Pawnees and uh, kill four of them. We talked about that earlier. Let, but let's say they didn't, let's say there were seven Pawnees and they killed four of them, but they captured three. What happens to the three who are captured? Well, the warriors out there in the field get to decide right then and there whether to just kill them or maybe, you know, maybe torture them uh, to death or maybe take them home to their village. If they choose to take them home to their village, once they arrive there, uh, then usually it's not the warriors who then get to make the decision. Uh, it is the women of the tribe. Uh, once they get in the village, the women decide whether to spare them or to kill them or to torture them to death or just kill them outright. So that if they spare them, they might immediately adopt them into the tribe to replace some of the people they've lost. Um, or the other option is that they might keep them as captives and make them do forced labor. Uh, this is what's called kinship slavery. You are a slave because you're not a member of the tribe. If you'd been adopted, then you would then be a full member of the tribe. Uh, but if you're not, then you're an outsider, uh, and so you can be forced to do the labor. Now, this is different from chattel slavery or plantation slavery, which is what the Europeans and later uh, white Southerners practiced where uh, people are slaves because they belong to a particular race and they're born slaves and they're expected to die slaves. And it's all part of a big economic process. Uh, this is not an economic process. The, the captive slaves probably are going to uh, uh, belong to a particular household and they're going to help out with the chores, basically. Um, and it's not, uh, it's not something that uh, they are by virtue of which tribe they're in because a member from any tribe or any other national group could be adopted. Uh, so it's not just like, well, you're Pawnee, therefore you'll always be a slave, although Pawnees were frequently enslaved by other tribes. Um, also, it's not necessarily permanent because frequently what would happen is these captives... After a period of time, if they showed themselves to be uh, uh, trustworthy, if they showed themselves to be uh, valuable contributors to the community, then there's every chance that eventually they would be adopted into the tribe. And once adopted, they're not like an ex-slave with uh, limited rights. Once adopted, they are a full member of the tribe and they have all the rights of any other member of that tribe. Uh, so uh, this is stuff Europeans didn't really understand. Uh, another thing uh, to, that I want to mention before I talk about this picture here is what I mentioned before when we were talking about rituals and ceremony. Uh, ceremony and ritual oftentimes are ways of acting out something that is metaphorical that perhaps uh, you hope to make happen or that you want to symbolize something. Now, frequently, uh, among tribes in the East, and I'm not so sure how often this was done in the Great Plains, but among the woodland Indians, um, 
if you wanted to engage in trade or diplomacy with someone who was not a member of your tribe, you had to somehow make them a member of your tribe, either officially by adopting them or semi-officially by sort of symbolically adopting them. And that uh, symbolic adoption was frequently uh, carried out in a ritual or a ceremony that acted out the way that uh, uh, adoptions would be made of captive slaves, which is to say that the person would be captured, uh, their fate would be death uh, or adoption, and a, a female member of the tribe would make, uh, of the village, would make that decision. Okay, so this picture is a picture of uh, not uh, a Plains tribe, but it's in the uh, in Virginia uh, in the early 1600s. Captain John Smith before Powhatan uh, and uh, uh, Pocahontas, the, the daughter of the chief, begged for his life. Now, the story you've probably heard, because this is the story John Smith wrote in his diary, uh, was that he was captured by these Indians. They were going to kill him. And the beautiful princess uh, fell madly in love with him and, and threw herself over his body and begged for his life. And so the chief relented and allowed him to live. Um, actually, uh, Captain John Smith was pretty full of himself. And uh, everywhere he went in the world, according to his ship's logs and his diary, beautiful princesses were falling madly in love with him, which kind of makes you wonder if that actually was the case. Uh, but that's how he interpreted what happened. But it's entirely possible, especially considering the fact Pocahontas was about nine years old and not a teenager at this time, it's entirely possible that uh, uh, Powhatan wanted to open trade negotiations with these newly arrived English, but in order to do that, you had to symbolically adopt one of them. And in order to symbolically adopt one of them, you had to act out this ritual of them being captured and spared. And it was the women of the village who made the decision. So it's entirely possible that this whole thing that we know so well from elementary school onward was actually a complete misunderstanding by the very vain John Smith of something completely different from what he thought was happening. Well, this too is something that you don't see very often portrayed in the movies. Now, uh, when I teach this course in person and we meet in class, I show several movies. Uh, I talked earlier about Little Big Man. I show that one. I'm going to talk more about it in a minute. Uh, but I also show show this one. It's called A Man Called Horse. Um, came out in 1970. Starred Richard Harris, uh, that some of you may know better as the first Dumbledore, uh, in his younger days. Uh, it's based on a short story, a classic short story by the author Dorothy Johnson. In the short story, it was a crow tribe. It was uh, uh, basically the story is uh, Richard Harris plays an Englishman, I think in the 1820s, who was out hunting on the Great Plains and gets captured by Lakota Sioux Indians, uh, who then uh, decide not to kill him, uh, although they killed the other people that were with him. They took him back to their village, and he became a captive slave. And they, actually, they gave him to an old woman whose son had been killed in the raid, sort of to now, you know, to, to help her to do the hard work that the son would do for her. And so uh, the meaning of the uh, title, A Man Called Horse, is that they, they called him Horse uh, because they used him as a beast of burden to do the hard labor. And... Uh, uh, there you can see uh, in the upper right, there's the old woman in the background. Uh, and eventually, uh, eventually he proves himself when some, I think it was Pawnee, attack. And he participates in the defense of the village. Uh, and then he gets adopted and becomes a full member. Uh, and then he goes through a sun dance. And so they show very graphically a sun dance. Uh, this movie... Uh, is problematic in some ways. Uh, in fact, it's a little um, it's it's a little difficult in in spots to sit through nowadays because it kind of makes me cringe a little bit because there's so much of the white savior trope involved. Because 
obviously, you know, in this in this story, he turns out not just to become a member of the tribe, but to become like the best warrior in the tribe, as always happens with the white person in these stories, it seems. Uh, but other than that, other than that, uh, there is, for the very first time in 1970, you saw some of these rituals and some of these cultural practices uh, shown on film, and not shown in a judgmental way, as in, look how backward these people are. In fact, um, there were a couple of sequels to the movie, and in the first sequel, it starts off with the uh, character, John Morgan, who was an English lord, by the way, uh, having uh, left the, uh, the village and the Lakota band and gone back to England, living in his big, huge mansion, but feeling horribly disconnected and lonely and missing his Native American family and that Native American lifestyle, so he goes back to it. That actually is the sort of thing that happened frequently. In fact, uh, one might even say usually that when people were adopted into uh, one of these tribes, um, they often didn't want to come back uh, because of the egalitarian lifestyle that they had. Uh, but there is that problem, like I said, with the white savior narrative. Uh, so I want to just uh, talk about movies for a second. These are three movies, three famous movies, big budget Hollywood films, about white guys who get adopted by Indians. Uh, so in 1970, uh, A Man Called Horse and Little Big Man both came out. Uh, Dances with Wolves exactly 20 years later. Uh, some of you probably seen you, you you probably more likely to have seen Dances with Wolves unless you're unless you're my age or older. Uh, Dances with Wolves was good in a lot of ways. There's a lot of things I liked about it. For one thing, it showed the humanity of again the Lakota were the uh, uh, natives in question in this movie. It showed their their humanity. It showed them laughing and joking as actual Indians really did and really do because they're they're people. But oftentimes in Hollywood movies, there are always these solemn, somber, stoic, uh, um, unrealistic cardboard characters. And so uh, in, in this one, it was, it was refreshing to see uh, that they had distinct personalities. But th it was still a problem because that white savior thing, uh, probably I'm going to, uh, this is a spoiler if you haven't seen it, but Kevin Costner's character, who was in the uh, U.S. Army, uh, gradually uh, associates more and more with this Lakota tribe, and he joins the tribe and is adopted. Uh, but then at the end, he's the leader, just like Richard Harris at the end of A Man Called Horses uh, become the leader, which is really inappropriate. You know, it is a uh, um, the white savior myth uh, that is so often portrayed in popular culture uh, in which a white person joins some uncivilized group and be, by virtue of his superior civilization and his just general superiority, he's better uh, than they are uh, at what they themselves do before it's all over with, which is why I like Little Big Man, even though it is through the point of view of a white character. Um, Little Big Man was... Um, heavily promoted and endorsed by a lot of famous Native Americans in 1970, like Vine Deloria, a uh, Lakota that we will be talking about quite a bit toward the end of this course, and other, uh, other Native people as well. And I think the reason for that is two things. Uh, not just the, uh, the gender situation, which I talked about earlier, not just the fact that they show that, realistically and non-judgmentally, but there's a lot of things, basic intrinsic things about Plains Indian culture that you never see in movies that you see in this movie. And it is not, uh, you know, shown in such a way as look how stupid these people are. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, the lead character in Little Big Man uh, is not a white savior uh, because he doesn't, he's not able to save anybody, really. Uh, so... Um, I come down stronger in favor of this one than the others. But it's better if you can find a movie, and it's hard to do, that is about Native people, that is told from a Native point of view. 
Uh, and I say that's hard to do. Here's an example. This isn't necessarily uh, a plains group, the Chiricahua Apache were in the desert southwest. But there was a movie about Geronimo that came out uh, in the uh, 1990s, I think 93, maybe 93, 94. Uh, and Wes Studi, the famous Cherokee actor, the first Native American to be awarded an Oscar, although not for this role, he played Geronimo in a movie about Geronimo, and he got fourth billing behind the white general, the white guy that meets Geronimo, and the white guy who's a friend of the white guy who meets Geronimo. So I guess I've kind of like gotten off the subject a little bit, uh, but um, that's the sort of thing that you... Uh, have to be aware of um, the best, most accurate, and most um, inclusive movies about Native people in recent years have been those movies made by Native American directors and actors. And I'll talk later about some of uh, some of those films.